Hi, welcome back to educator.com. Today we're not going to Hi, welcome back to educator.com. Today we're going to talk about graphing functions, window settings, and the table of values. For the most part, graphing functions or equations that are in the form y equals stuff, stuff, stuff involving some x is pretty direct. Just enter the function into the graphing calculator and graph it. The graphing calculator expects the variable to be x, so if your function has a different variable, just change it over when entering the function. For example, if you had something like f of t equals t squared plus 5t minus 3, when you enter it in, you should enter in x squared plus 5x minus 3. You just swap out all of whatever the variable used to be for x because it expects it to be x when you plug it in. But this has no effect on what shape the graph is, so no worries there. Just like calculating values, the syntax we choose will affect how the function graphs. If we wanted to graph the function f of x equals 2 raised to the 2x, we might be tempted to enter 2 exponent 2x. Remember, this right here, the caret means exponent. If we have 3 caret 7, that's saying 3 to the 7th. So 2 caret 2x, we think that will be 2 raised to the 2x. However, that would actually give us 2 raised to the 2 times x. It sees that as 2 raised 2 and then the next thing entirely. Instead, to get the correct entry, we have to use parentheses to indicate how it's all put together. So we wrap our 2x in parentheses so it sees that we're raising 2 to the entire thing of 2x. 2x together is our exponent, and the parentheses show that it's that whole object that we're using as our exponent. So it's really important to use parentheses when you're not quite sure how the interpretation interpretation will work out. Once again, better safe than sorry, and extra parentheses aren't going to hurt you, but if you miss parentheses in an important place, it can really screw things up. The viewing window. One of the most important ideas when graphing is to think about the viewing window. Now, since a graph goes on forever, right, it never stops going on, you can only ever see a portion of it, which is what you have in your viewing window. Your viewing window is the portion of the graph that you're seeing it. Most graphing calculators will start the viewing window looking at x going from negative 10 to 10 and y going from negative 10 to 10, or something close to that. But often, that's not a very useful way to look at whatever function we're working with. It works well for a lot of functions, but it's not going to work for every single function. For example, consider if we wanted to graph the function f of x equals the square root of x minus 17. Well, if we graph that function on normal axes, those right here, sometimes called standard zoom, we, could see, we would see this. Right? It doesn't show up on the viewing window at all. So f of x equals the square root of x minus 17, with x going from negative 10 to 10 and y going from negative 10 to 10, doesn't show up at all in a standard zoom, in our standard normal way of looking at it. Because square root of x minus 17 isn't defined for any x value going from negative 10 to 10, right? So it doesn't wind up working. So just because they're the standard axes, and just because those are probably what we're going to get the first time we graph with something, doesn't mean we should assume that's the only part of the graph, right? There's other parts to go on, and depending on the specific function, the normal standard part might not be the interesting part at all. Well, the graphing calculator will allow you to zoom out. So if you get something where you don't really see the whole thing, you can always zoom out. Press the zoom button and zoom out until you can see the part that you're looking for. And then you can zoom back in on the section you care about or put a box so it zooms in just on that specific portion. But that can be a slow, cumbersome process, especially depending on the speed of your calculator. Some calculators, it takes them a while to do each zoom. And so it could take you like 30 seconds or 60 seconds just to get to the section you actually care about looking at. Similarly, depending on the calculator, you might be able to scroll the window window over, be able to click it over one piece at a time, sort of nudge it one direction or another. But once again, this process can wind up being pretty slow. If you've got a not very powerful graphing calculator, it has to redraw it every time you nudge it over. And if it takes a little while for it to draw out the graph, that can once again be 30 seconds or a minute of just waiting for it to go step by step over and over. Plus, you might not even be sure which way the interesting stuff's going to happen if you just immediately try to scroll it around. Instead, I say, at least, other teachers might say other things, but personally, I recommend the best option is usually to just manually choose your window settings. Go to the window settings and take your direct control of the viewing window. Tell it where you want to look. If you look at the window settings, the important parts are these four. 
X min, X max, Y min, Y max, where your horizontal axis starts, where the horizontal axis ends, where the vertical axis starts, and where the vertical axis ends. By changing the values given for these, it will move the placement and size of your viewing window accordingly. So this gives you direct control over what you're looking at. Also, because you've got direct control, when you look at the graph, you'll already know how did I frame this? How big is it horizontally? How big is it vertically? So you can have a sense for what the aspect ratio will be like. You might also be interested in changing either X scale or Y scale, the length that tick marks are spread on the respective axes, right? By tick marks, I mean those little ticks that say how many units we've moved. Usually you don't need to actually care about the tick marks, but sometimes they can help for seeing some types of function. It might be handy to have a sense for just how far you out. For example, in trig, it often helps to set x scale equal to pi over 2, because very often the interesting stuff happens at pi over 2 or something along those lines of pi scale, so it can be handy to set a specific tick mark value, but not necessary. By thinking about the function we're graphing, we can usually figure out a good starting place for the window. So going back to our example of f of x equals the square root of x minus 17, we know it won't start before x equals 17, because if we put an x equals 17, it's less than that, right? If we put an x less than 17, it's going to be undefined because we'll have negatives in our square root. So we know it won't start before x equals 17. We also know it only outputs positive numbers because it's square root, and so square root there is only going to be able to allow us to get positive numbers out of it. And finally, we know that it's going to grow very slowly because we've probably graphed a square root function before, and we know that they slow down the farther we get out. Taking all of this into account, we might set our graph of f of x equals square root of x minus 17 with our x value as going from 0 to 40, because we know that it's going to be a while before any, anything interesting happens. We have to go at least past 17 to see anything show up on the graph at all, and since it grows slowly, we'll probably want to go out to a fairly large x value. We can set our y from 0 to 5, because we know since it grows very slowly, and since it's only positive, that there's not going to be a whole lot of action happening vertically, so we might as well just set it to a fairly small thing, so we can see exactly what's going on there. So we graph it like that, and we would get this graph right here. However, notice, just because the graph looks square doesn't mean that the aspect ratio actually is square. In this case, our y managed to go only from 0 to 5, while our x manages to go from 0 to 40. So for this specific picture that we're seeing right here, we see that it's been sort of squished horizontally because it has such a short distance vertically, so it seems like it's moving a lot more vertically, but in reality it's actually going growing out very slowly. So by paying attention to the window settings as we do them manually, we'll have a sense for what the picture we're looking at actually means in addition to being able to quickly and easily control where we'll be looking. A great use for a graphing calculator is the table of values. The table of values allows you to quickly churn out values for various inputs on some function. For example, if we have f of x equals 4x squared minus 7x plus 9, we could hit the table button, we go to look at the table, and it would display something like what we have to the right, where we've got x and f of x. So we'd see negative 3 gets us 66, negative 2 gets us 39, negative 1 gets us 20, 0 gets us 9, etc, etc. If we want additional values, we can just scroll up or down the list to find more. If you take your cursor and you push one way or the other, it will normally be able to show you more of the values one way or the other. It'll depend on the specific calculator you're using, how it works. If it doesn't quite wind up working for you, do a quick internet search and you'll be able to figure out how to get other values on your table. However, the most useful thing for a table of values is what I'm about to tell you. Of course, often you want to have more control over what numbers the function uses for inputs, right? Having it go only at integer steps, it's sometimes useful, but very often you want to actually tell it what numbers to map. And if it's an integer input, you could probably do it by hand pretty easily. What you care about is the difficult numbers to plug in, like decimal things. In that case, what you want to do is go to the table settings, find the table settings on your calculator, and go to the independent variable. Change your independent variable, which is just the x what you're plugging into the function, and change it from automatic, what it normally starts at, to ask. So you're changing it from it setting it for you to it waiting for you to tell it what value to use. With it set on ask, the table will start off blank. You can then enter whatever value you want for the input, and then it will give you the outputs from the inputs that you give it in. For example, if we have f of x equals 4x squared minus 7x plus 9, we might be curious, for some reason, for the problem we're working on, we want to know what is 4.7. So we put in, we type into our type in with our calculator, 4.7 for the input, we hit enter, and 
boom, it says 64.46. We could enter whatever we wind up wanting to know, right? We might be interested in 12, negative 3.9, pi. We can just plug in the various numbers, we hit enter, and it just immediately cranks out what comes out of the function. This setting makes it extremely easy to just churn out massive numbers of values for a table. Making tables comes up a lot in math, and this makes it so much less tedious. Being able to just set up our function once, and then just put in number, put in number, put in number, put in number, and then we can just write the things down in a table of values. If we try to do it each time by hand, right, we'd have to do 4 times 4.7 squared minus 7 times 4.7 plus 9. Even if we're using a calculator but we're working through calculations, it's going to take a long time to do one of these after another after another. It's normally so much easier to just set up a function that does what you want to do in general and then just put in the various values that you're interested in looking at. That way you can just churn out all the values really, really quickly and it doesn't take a long time. It's easy. It's much more comfortable that way. All right. In the next lesson, we'll look at how we can find some of the more interesting points on our graph. All right. We'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.